Hello and welcome to our Grow Your Business special on businesses and their owners who are thinking outside the square and are building quality operations. I've got up close and personal with these business winners to see how they've learnt to become the cream of the crop. Joshua Nichols is the founder of Platinum Electrical who has learned how to franchise tradespeople. Joshua, at a young age, took out the Telstra Small Business Award of the Year and has won many awards for his great business feats. Tom Baker is the founder of Mr Black, which is setting the drinking world alight with his unique alcoholic coffee brew. Angus Woods has thought outside the square to create a multifaceted business which actually rates financial advisors in a post-Royal Commission world where consumers have become increasingly suspicious about advisors. The business is called Advisor Ratings. What else? Gavin Slater is a CEO of Nimble, which is an online business designed to provide loans to those Aussies who can't qualify for loans from conventional lenders. Bradley Beer is from BMT Tax Depreciation, who runs a successful quantity surveyor business. And for anyone contemplating being a property investor, the big takeout lesson is don't buy a property without a quantity surveyor. All right, Josh, Nicholas, thanks for joining us on the program. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I love having you on the show. I've, I've known you since you were a kid. Yes. How old were you when you started your business? I was 22 years of age. Yeah. Yeah. And for those people who don't know, Platinum Electrical. Is that still your name or have you no, added to it? No, we've changed it now. We're Platinum Electricians. Okay. So, yeah, and the, the little theory behind that is um, more talking about who we are, yeah. not so much what we do. Because electrical could be a, a tech company. It could be you know, a, a maker. Of electric. I mean, Correct. You, you're, you're in the people business, aren't you? 100%. Mm. And our culture of our business, everything about our business is people, is relationship. Yeah. So it's very much, we decided... That was probably about five years ago now. So we were originally platinum electrical contractors and yeah. then we went to platinum electricians. Sort of sharper, more modern, mm. little tweak. Would never recommend doing it again. Changing a brand. Yeah. So little, just changing a few little letters off mm. the end. It was such an exercise. But okay. Take people back to how you ended up. Well, you, you were an electrician, weren't you? Correct. Yeah. And then you decided you wanted to grow the business and you, you needed to have a good way of doing that. So take, yep. take us through those initial thoughts. Yeah, for me, in the first five years, I grew the business um, quite well. Obviously, mm. I, um, the story goes where um, in the first five years, I grew to a place where the business could run without me. So mm. I had uh, 12 vans on the road and I had a team running the business and I got to that stage in business where I thought, what next from here? Mm. I didn't really want to keep growing up. There was mm. more risk involved with that and taking on bigger projects and possibly getting into construction, which really wasn't my sort and of the thing. And the big builder developers can really bring uh, good tradespeople undone, can't they? Quite easily, yeah. quite quickly. Mm. You have to be very sharp. Um, it's all around clauses and right mm. solicitors. And yeah. it wasn't a game that I really wanted to and get you into. you want economic cycles to work in your favour as well. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So... For me, um, I went to a seminar and it was on business shares and property. And mm. there was one little section there. It was in New Zealand. Mm. And there was one little section that ran for about an hour of the day, over three days. Mm. And it was about franchising. And it was just one of those moments where sometimes people say to you, there's that moment in your life where a light bulb goes off. Mm. And they mentioned franchising. Mm. To me, it was just automatic. It was, I could grow the brand out. It was very relational model. Mm. And for me, I came home from that and went, this is the direction I'm going to okay. take. At what stage did you win your first business award? Was it when you were just the, the, the one man, 12 van guy, or was it beyond that? No, it was um, the, the biggest one around that sort of 12 van period was the Telstra Business Awards. Yeah. Um, that was back in 07. Um, and and that's probably when I first, well, I might, have, I might have got you before, because you won an Australia, Australia Post Award. Yes, as well. that's right, in 2005, yeah, good yeah, memory. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in 2000. 2007, we took out the national title for yeah. Telstra. Yeah. Um, for small business or for that? Right, right. Uh, uh, that was in the category by memory from yeah. around 20 to 50 employees, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so after that, you thought, well, the next stage is this franchising. Correct. Idea. Yeah. Okay. But surely a lot of people, and I know you do know some pretty smart people in business because I've, I've met you know, and I know some of your advisors and whatever, there was a franchising and tradespeople. Hasn't really ever been done before, to my knowledge, <laughs> to any success. Yes, it was something where I came back after getting the initial concept of mm. franchising. Had no idea if you could do it with the trade business. But for me, 
straight away I learned that I was what I class one of the, you could call lucky ones or ones that were happy to pay a lot of money to get a lot of advice to yep. get me to a business model. But there's so many tradies out there mm. that are fantastic at what they do on the tools, mm. but have never learned business. No. And we all think, myself included at the time, thought, I'm a good tradie, mm. I'll make a good businessman. Yes. And soon you discover quite quickly, I have no idea what I'm doing in the business mm. world. Mm. So I thought if I could take the lessons that I've learned and had success with and replicate that to fantastic tradesmen out there, mm. equip them with the business side, it works for me, it works for them. Mm. This has to work, that's what I thought at the time. Yeah, okay. And how easy was it to actually marry those two things in. Fantastic <laughs> tradesmen mm. who then were, were willing to adopt a fantastic business system. How yeah. easy was it? Like, like everything in business, you get in going, this will be a piece of cake. Yeah. Um, look, it's had its challenges, I, I won't lie. Mm. Um, it was a huge setup. Uh, we're 10 years into franchising now. Mm. So really since 2007 to now, we've been on that journey um, or a little bit past, I suppose. Mm. But no, it was a challenge. Uh, for me, I love working with people. I mm. love growing people, love growing businesses. Mm. So they always say, if your why is big enough, the how becomes easy. So for me, um, the why was always, I wanted to help grow people, um, help turn them into business owners. And then from there, what their business can achieve in their own lives. Mm. So there was, there's been hurdles, there's still hurdles today, but we've still been having a lot of growth year on year on year. Mm. Uh, it's been a fantastic journey and still enjoying it. Well, you know, I've, I've watched the franchising system for a long, long time. And the two standout things that seem to be critical for the success of a franchising system is the calibre of the master franchisor, mm -hmm. the, the franchisor, yep. and, the, and the systems he or she creates around it. Correct. And then the calibre of the people selected as well. Because I've seen some great businesses suffer because um, a couple have a divorce and yeah. everything goes wrong mm. and the, the business is still good and even mm. the location where they're working is good, but the whole family thing. How have you dealt with that? those kinds of curveball challenges? Yes, so no, very interesting <coughs> fact. I'm not sure what are the divorce rates, but when you get any sort of great sum of people together, and mm. a lot of our franchise owners are husband and wife or yeah. uh, married couples, that the, the, re the reality for us is, I think the divorce rate might be 50% or mm. as alarming as that is. So we have, we learned that part of our business model is that when couples go through hiccups in their marriage or that's part of our responsibility to help them through that process. Mm. So yeah. um, we have platinum chaplains involved. So we found ourselves getting a little bit too involved with the franchise owners yeah. with personal stuff kicking mm. in because our heart was to help them. But mm. you've got to, there's a line there you've got to be careful with. Yeah. So um, we now have people that are trained and um, that so can you counsel. Do you contract it out or you have it in-house? Um, no, it's contracted out. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. professionals. Yeah, yeah, for professionals when it gets into the real sort of heavy stuff. But it's part of our business model. How many franchise outlets have you got? Uh, there's 52 franchise outlets as mm. we speak now. Yeah. And um, what states are you in? Uh, we're in all states. We're just not in Tassie. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Is that yeah. something that's going to happen one day? It will happen one day. Mm. But again, like you said earlier, it just comes down to really finding that right person. We've mm. got a huge market down there. And uh, we're just trying to wait for that really right person. Mm, okay. So um, looking back at your time, and you've already mentioned a few things that so some people, if they're astute, would realise has been critically important to your success. But if you have to pinpoint the, the, the major moments in your life where you learnt something that has changed you forever as a businessman, what would those moments be? One was clearly discovering franchising. That was yeah. What else? Yeah, big question. <laughs> um, I, and think, I want a big answer yeah, too, yeah. Josh. All right, all right. Defining moments for me is, um, look, pr probably one of the, I would say biggest thing for me is giving, what I call giving debt the respect it deserves. Mm. Um, in this day and age that we live in, everything's buy now, pay later, mm. um, drive the fancy car now, do this now, do that now, holiday now, have the big house now, yeah. pay later, pay later, pay later. I learned very much in the earlier days, in the in the start of franchising, back around that sort of 08, 09 era, where for me, personally speaking, I just didn't give debt the respect it deserved. If I wanted to, I was a young businessman, mm. I was like, yep, we need more vans, yep, we need franchising, yep, we need to trademark, yep, we need to, we need mm. to, we need mm. to. And mm. all of a sudden I realised I had this huge amount of debt mm. And all it takes is one little slow period, or like you said, the 
economics change of what's going on or the yeah. building industry and suddenly you're like, oh, the debts don't go away or slow down with a mm -hmm. slowdown. So for me, the defining moment is for me now is I don't just get into debt very easy. Mm -hmm. um, I pretty well run debt free mm -hmm. unless it's income producing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that would be one of my biggest things now and I teach my franchise owners the same thing. Okay. I also know that you have understood the value of having people advise you who know stuff that you don't know. How important have advisors or mentors or business coaches yeah. been to you? Um, super important. I wouldn't be where I am without having my business coach. Uh, he's still involved in the business to this day and has mm. been for the last 15 years of our 19 year life. Okay, so you have been perceived, at least by Telstra, as, as a champion businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you and I know exactly where you were yeah. then, compared to where you are now, but you yeah. were. You, your achievements were, were brilliant. Mm -hmm. But you, a bit like Federer, Federer still has a coach, you 100%. still have a coach. Is that the th sort of thing? 100%. And mm -hmm. like I teach my franchise owners, that life is about leveraging off other people that have been there and done it yeah. or know more than you. Mm -hmm. And in this life, it's short, and you need to keep learning off the people that have been there and done it. There's yeah. books, there's all sorts of things. Mm. Online, um, as you know, there's, there's so many people to leverage off, and mm. I have many people in my life that I leverage off for all different areas, personal, business, relationships, mm. but to me, it's all about leverage. Mm. Um, so when I met you, you say you're, you're a kid, big, big goals, big aspirations, and, mm. you're, and you were kicking goals, but um, what about leadership? How good a leader were you then compared to how you are now? And if you're better, how come you're better at leadership? Yeah, I think um, with leadership, I was brought up in a, an environment uh, with my parents and how they raised me. I think there was natural leadership there hmm. that I didn't even know that I discovered when I first got into business hmm. that it wasn't sort of till I look back and people saying to me around leadership and things like that. For me, my leadership style has never been dictatorship. It's always been relational. It mm. still is this day. Um, I wouldn't say it's changed massively since then, but what has come into the fold, obviously, with experience in business is that you learn along the way. Mm. There's mistakes, obviously, you make as a leader where you may not communicate as well as you should have or learning how to communicate to the right personality types is another big thing. Um, so I think over the years I've got wiser through trial and error as we all do as leaders mm. going, oh, I won't do that again. Um, but my, my leadership style has always been relational. Mm. Um, always, I think people underestimate what they're capable of. Mm. Everybody, uh, that you can take people that, it might be a junior position in the business, but sometimes you can just see with the right attitude, the right mentoring, mm. they don't even realize it, but with the right leader that comes along, you can take people to the sky's the limit. Okay. What, what book or tape or video had the biggest impact on you as a businessman? Well, I... For me, it was yeah. uh, John Maxwell's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. That was a, a yeah. big one for me. Yeah, you listen, I was just going to say the same thing. That's, right. that, that's that foundational leadership mm. um, that I think everyone needs to uh, read. For me, um, I actually listened to that on the CD. I think it was 21 CDs. Right. <laughs> yes. yeah. Actually, that would have been, it was four or five CDs. He's, but I remember having it on CD. Yeah, he's very entertaining, um, John, as well. Yeah, yeah. so that, that was definitely a fundamental. Um, for me, a couple of recents was the, um, the Paddy McGrath, um, I think it's an audio book that's called yeah. Powerful, yeah. Uh, and her Netflix story there in the HR side. That was very um, good for me. Another mm. book, Scaling Up, which is obviously yeah. a quite famous book. Ver Vern Harnish. Vern Harnish, mm. yeah. Um, yeah, so there's been some like that. Look, The Barefoot Investor is a fantastic one as well. Mm. He's had huge success, but he's very good with just fundamental money management that mm. you can... Uh, a lot of his principles you can apply to business as well. Mm. So there's been thousands along the journey. Like mm. I, I read multiple books um, every single year. Mm. Um, audio books, I'm always getting information in. That's leverage again. Yeah. Josh Nichols, he's in the country and your family proud. Well done. Appreciate it. Thanks, Cheers, Peter. Tom, thanks for joining us on the program. Thanks so much. So tell us about your background with Mr. Black. So I started Mr. Black in 2013. Um, I was an industrial designer, so I worked in a design agency and loved coffee. So mm. I did a lot of coffee packaging work, worked for a lot of coffee companies and was just a big drinker of coffee like yeah. a lot of Australians are. Yeah. 
Um, and then one day I just wanted to know more about people that make stuff. I thought craft spirits were going to be big. Yeah. So I got my car and I drove up the Central Coast to the Distillery Botanica. And there I met this guy called Philip Moore, um, who is, uh, like me, he loves coffee, but he's really good at making stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, gave me a try of some things he was making. I was about to leave and he goes, have a try of this. Mm. Open this little bottle, gave me a taste of this product. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, what's that? He's yeah. like, oh, it's a, it's a coffee liqueur I'm working on. Do you like it? Yeah. So I feel like this is exceptional, yeah. you know, and um, that really changed my life forever. It's funny, as you're telling that story, it takes me back in time when Bailey's came to Australia for the first time. I was a very young guy. Yeah. And I thought, how good is this? This it's, is like just something like you've never tried milk, before. Milk with good stuff in it. <laughs> it's all the good stuff, yeah. yeah. And I think that's the thing about coffee as well, mm. right? Like, you know, we are, I know it is a coffee liquor, but if I'm doing a tasting in a Dan Murphy's, right? Mm. I ask people if they like to try a coffee liquor, they're like, no, not so much. But if you ask someone if they like coffee, you can see their heart melt, right? Yeah, and yeah. this is what happened yeah. with Philip, right? Mm. You know, like, you know, I met him, he's like, do you like coffee? I was like, I love coffee. I remember sitting in the car with my mom driving to school when I was mm. younger, mm. her drinking coffee out of a flask. So mm. it's one of those things that runs deep with people. Yeah, and, and you don't really look like a liqueur guy to me either. I'm not, well, I mean, that's the crazy thing. I, like one of our big challenges at Mr. Black is while we are a coffee liqueur, yeah. not a lot of people, if they don't have Mr. Black, are gonna go buy a bottle of Kalur or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Like what we tap into is people's love of coffee not the classic liqueur drinking market because mm. it's just boozy coffee. Okay, so tell us how significant Mr. Black as a company has become. So really interesting, in terms of like volume share, we're still quite small. As I say value share in Australia, we're still about 15% of coffee liqueurs, right? So we're still quite small of value of coffee liqueurs in Australia. Yeah. But I think what's really important is the impact we've had on the industry, right? Mm. So five years ago when we started this, I did an interview with a very similar drinks journalist. They were doing an interview on coffee and they're like, we haven't really done anything on coffee in the booze world for a very long time. Mm. It's like the booze world just stuck at Kahlua, Tia Maria and some other dusty bottles on the shelf that mm. weren't really a thing. So I guess they end up in cocktails. So I mean, yeah. Right, mostly. And then um, five years later, six years later, since we've started, there have probably been another 40 coffee and liqueurs launched after us. Mm. Um, and Mr. Black's now sold at you know, 11 Madison Park in New York, Rockpool Group here in Australia. Mm. You know, the world's best bars and restaurants now have modern coffee cocktails on them. So. While we're still small on the scale of booze world, mm. um, our impact's been quite big. And what's your sales, export sales, compared to other, you know, spirits uh, produced out of Australia? Yeah, so quite quickly we thought, there were, obviously we knew the opportunity to be the uh, homegrown craft spirit local hero in Australia was significant, mm. so we've, we've never taken our eye off the Australian market, but export markets make up about 50% of our total volume, maybe mm. more, almost 60% this year, mm. and I expect by the end of next year, end of next financial year, it'll be 10 or 15% domestic, okay. so growing rapidly overseas. So was it a matter of Philip had the capacity to make stuff, yep. you're the one who said, this is so good, I think we can market this. Absolutely, so Philip is the genius, he's the, the genius in the shed yeah. that is amazing at making liquids. The Steve Wozniak, and you're the, he's, was, um, you're the Apple, you're a Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs of coffee liquor, right? That's a, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and you're not <laughs> overrating yourself. Maybe, maybe not, I think that's some hyperbole there. Yeah. No, generally, he's the guy in the yeah. shed, and I was the one that hopefully connected a coffee and liquor, which is a bit of an out of vogue category, mm. and gave it some meaning and and worked out how we could talk to people about it. Yeah, and, and you're made the, it look pretty, um, the It's a pretty cool design. It looks so. good when yeah. you make coffee and liquor for a living. Like your stuff's got to look pretty good yeah. to even get considered. Okay, so um, how hard was it to get uh, this sort of product sold overseas? Because everyone who's got a business here would love to think. I could become an exporter one day, but yeah. it seems like an enormously hard task. The, the, the challenges are numerous from, from this, the simple fact, like when you're young, it's like we don't have a bigger company behind us. Like everything that we have, we built ourselves, yeah. right? So when you go- So you're not as big as Diageo. Not quite, <laughs> not quite. But when you are, one day perhaps, mm. but when you are like go to get off the plane at JFK in New York, mm. You know no one. Mm. Where'd you start? And that's mm. often a lot like you've got no connection, so you're at risk of getting led astray down the wrong path. But the biggest problem, you know, we find with exporting is apart from all the regulation and especially in booze, it's absolutely draconian yeah. regulation, right? Mm. Um, it's just the fact you just have to have the investment behind you to invest ahead of the sales yeah. because you don't have the you don't live in the market necessarily, mm. you don't have the connections, you can't pull in the favours. <clears throat> So a lot of, it's really humbling when you get over there. A lot of Australian producers find that. They think, I'll go to the US, I'll go to the UK, big booze markets, mm. and then they get there and they don't have the home crowd advantage. They don't have a really clearly differentiated offering mm. and they're one in a sea of our distributor in the US has 10,000 products. Mm. 
And it's important in America to have a distributor on site, isn't it? Because Absolutely. they're the, the gatekeepers. Well, legally, in, in liquor, you have to. So you regular, you have to have an importer and a distributor in every state. Mm. So as far as booze concerned, it's like going to 50 different countries. Mm. So when we say we're, we're in the US, we're really only in about 11 states. Mm. Um, small businesses wouldn't get to a full national distribution in the US you know, until maybe year mm. five. What about Australia? Would they need help? Really useful, in fact. So we've had some um, interesting interactions with Austrade over the years, but the Export Market Development Grant, mm. while it's been scaled back uh, regrettably yeah. over the last few years, was really useful um, and gave us the confidence to invest overseas, knowing that the government sort of had our back on some of that investment. Really disappointing that they've capped the program, um, you know, given that it has bipartisan support and mm. is a great thing. Mm. Um, you know, um, but yeah, what was really useful in the early years, especially when you're absolutely strapped on your cash mm. and need to make every cent work. Yeah, we got some useful support there. Okay, the dollar being low, has that helped? Um, swings and roundabouts, right? Mm. You know, obviously a, a large part of our cost base is here in Australia, but mm. uh, we import coffees, predominantly US dollar centric. Mm. Our glass comes out of either Asia or Europe, so either Euro or US dollar denominated. So while we, while we do get sort of revenue in US dollars, mm. um, I mean, we were smashed by the Brexit thing, as a lot of people were. Obviously, a large business in the UK that sort of devalued itself a little bit. So, it has been a challenge. Um, but what do you do, right? It, Stop yeah. selling booze. I mean, it, it should be a massive windfall for us. But um, yeah, it's been tempered. Okay. Yeah. And what's it like employing lots of people? Um, it's sort of. It's definitely been the hardest challenge, uh, the most rewarding part of the job. Um, and, and definitely been like the key to unlocking growth in our business, right? Mm. So when we've got the right people on the ground in Australia, we've made some really good hires early on in the US, which, mm. which really gave us the growth there. Um, so they've definitely helped us unlock that. But at the same time, so many challenges. You know, when we've got, I think, almost 30 staff in, what, eight cities, three countries, requires you know, different operational setups and all mm. that for a business of a revenue of three million bucks or something, you know, mm. having operating companies overseas, it's a lot of complexity for a mm. business probably not quite where it needs to be yet um, in terms of revenue. So it adds complexity, but All right, Tom, setting itself up for the long term. Given the fact you said you're an industrial designer, that yeah. means I'm thinking you're not naturally uh, designed to be a leader slash boss <laughs> slash employer, uh, but you have to learn on the job. Yeah. Or was Philip sort of skilled in that sort of area or, or not? Um, so Phil really looks after the production side of the business. Yeah. So I've really, all of our sales, marketing, operations you efforts. You get easy so people sort of, look yeah, after, the sales people, every, the marketing everyone people. Else. Yeah, well about 25 <laughs> of the 28 I get. Um, no, massively, I'm still not good at it. I think you've just ultimately, I think hopefully the people that work with us understand that I'm still a you know tender age of 32. Everyone's learning in our business, yeah. right? And, and while I not be perfect, I think the fact we're a company based on a strong principle of taking coffee into the night, we know why we do it. Everyone knows why they come to work in the morning. Mm. You know, I'll stuff up some stuff every now and again. We're all human, right? But mm. definitely it's been a learning process. After six years now, I know what the balance sheet is at least. Yeah. So. Okay, so what's, what's the question I haven't asked that you would love me to ask? Oh, where can I buy it? How much does it cost? <laughs> okay, well, Dan question. Murphy's BWS. We're going internationally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Bevmo. How much does it cost? Uh, Dan Murphy's like fifty-five dollars a bottle. Okay. So you know, a bargain as far as I'm concerned. Takes yeah. a couple of weeks to make. Yeah, of course, it is not to be uh, tried by children at all. No children. Legal age drinking, adults only, um, and in moderation. I'm yeah. sure uh, the government would like me to say. But genuinely, I mean, we're, we're thankful to be in over three thousand um, bars and restaurants and liquor stores around the world now. So okay. you shouldn't be too far from a bottle. It was a good story, Tom. Congratulations. Thanks and so much. We look forward to seeing you progress in the future. You will. Thanks so much. I'm talking to Angus Woods, who is the founder and MD of Advisor Ratings. At a time when the financial advice industry is certainly under challenge, thanks to the Royal Commission. Thanks for joining us, Angus. Thank you very much, Peter. Is that true? It certainly is. There's a lot of ructions going on at the moment in the industry in general. Um, you are seeing a lot of concerned advisors mm. um, around the place looking to see what, where they end up and what they do with their futures at the mm. moment. And obviously that's going to impact consumers at the end of the day. Mm. Um, but we are seeing a movement of advisors within the industry and out of the industry. Yeah. What are the big movements? Are they moving out of financial institutions, looking for jobs with other financial advisors, or are, are some actually just leaving because of the, the threat of all the regulations they're gonna Yeah, find? Yeah, good question. That, both actually. Um, you've seen recently 
the big four have all exited financial advice. Mm. So I think the last one was Westpac announced that it was exiting financial advice. And mm. they, a lot of them, actually, a lot of the advisors within that group went to um, Viridian, which was a, a smaller boutique licensee, but they're being shopped out to other uh, licensees, smaller licensee groups. Um, and obviously CBA, ANZ and uh, uh, ANZ, CBA and Westpac have already already indicated their um, exiting advice. Mm. Um, and then with the, advi with the other advisors, you're seeing a lot of the exits happening generally across the board, particularly those advisors that are older, mm. uh, 50 years and older. Mm. Um, and a lot of that is because of the regulation, uh, the impost of regulation that's coming down. And the education. The education it. requirements. Mm. So um, FASIA, which is the Financial Advisors Standards and Ethics Authority, is now, and you would know this quite well, Peter, mm. probably, yep. um, you know, they're now imposing a lot of um, imposts on advisors, um, you know, imposts that I think at the end of the day will improve advice for the outcomes of general mm. uh, or, or the everyday Australians, but, you know, advisors now need to do an exam mm. um, over the next two years. Advisors also now need to um, do ongoing CPD training, which they didn't have to do before. Um, and they also now um, are looking to actually now need to be approved uh, with an approved degree, with, mm. a, with a qualification. Mm. Um, recently, you didn't have to actually do have to do that. So I think 60% of advisors um, are actually underqualified at the moment based on the new FASIA guidelines. Yes, right. And, and, and even, I guess, the most heavily qualified people will still have to do additional education. Correct. Every advisor is actually going Which to Which I'm going to have to do as well. You are, I know. Yeah. Every advisor is going to have to do some sort of bridging course yeah. to yeah. stay in the industry. The interesting thing is that the, the belief is that we needed more education when in actual fact we needed more ethical behaviour. Yes. That, I don't think the Royal Commission actually identified that advisors were poorly educated. No. They, yeah. they identified that they were, poorly, uh, they were poor when it comes to ethics. Yeah, no, and we're seeing that with, um, obviously, we're, that's the outcome of the Royal Commission, really, mm. with the whole um, bad advice element. Um, you know, I think every industry has its, I know we ter use the term bad yeah. eggs a lot, but... Oh, there are bad um, accountants, bad lawyers, even bad doctors and bad yeah. pharmacists, believe yeah. it or not. Well, you, you see, um, in the UK, when they um, implemented a, a lot of this regulation, and obviously the banning of commissions is the big one that's yeah. going to impact a lot of advisors, but... You saw, um, I think, 40% of advisors leave the industry um, when they did the retail distribution review mm. in the UK. I think you're going to see something similar here in Australia. Mm. Um, and, and what does what that, that mean? Well, you explain to, to our yeah. uh, viewers what, what you mean by that. Well, they, uh, what that means is, um, so for the in the UK, they they banned they banned product commissions. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, the income that advisors earned was all, mostly from commissions earned from their products, mm. uh, which therefore wasn't you know, the, the cost was borne by the product as opposed to the consumer mm. or the client. Mm. Uh, now what's going to happen is a lot of these commissions, and uh, whilst they've been banned in Australia for a couple of years, the biggest one that's been released in the legislation that's just been announced is the removal of grandfathered commissions. So a lot of advisors were still earning a lot of commission off old product. Yeah, um, and particularly yeah. insurance policies. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so what that means now is that that banning of the commissions now going to that income is going to have to come from somewhere. Mm. And we think that it's going most likely, as opposed to coming from the product issuer, mm. it most likely will have to come from the consumer mm. or the client. Mm. Um, and what that does is put up the cost of advice. Mm. Um, so. You know, and then, uh, you know, who does get advice in the end? And mostly it's going to be high net worths mm. um, as opposed to the mum and dad yeah. sort of retail investors. A lot of advisors would have fallen off their hammocks at Byron Bay and the Gold Coast. I would have oh, thought after that. Yeah, but yeah, they would have. They would have. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, in terms of um, the companies, we know the financial institutions are getting out of financial advice. What's happened to AMP? Yeah, AMP is an interesting one. Um, well, they've got their strategic review and financial announcement coming up on Thursday. Mm. Uh, so AMP, um, at the moment, you've seen overall they're, they're, they're trimming their advisor numbers drastically. Mm. So I think at their top, they were like they had three and a half thousand advisors back mm. three years ago. Mm. That's now at two thousand two hundred. Mm. So more than a sort of fifty percent decline in their advisor numbers. Mm. Uh, It'd be interesting to see where the whole wealth management business is going because obviously there's been a lot of talk around their buyer of last resort scheme. Yeah. Um, advisors in there who basically have a book 
of clients um, and A&P are obligated to offer them 4% um, on that sort of the, the revenue that they're incurring. Now, with the removal of grandfather commissions, with the exodus of financial advisors, where does that, and the exodus of clients from those books, mm. where does that put the liabilities of AMP mm. um, in terms of what that means for their financial results on the 8th? And then what does it mean for the future of AMP is going to be really interesting, especially mm. if clients no longer, because AMP were the brand that gave advice to every mum and dad Australian. Mm, yeah. And that's the way they position themselves. So this will be a new, really, really interesting mm. announcement come the 8th of August and how they navigate that. And I, I presume a lot of AMP financial advisors uh, now don't want to ha use the letters AMP. No, exactly. And, and yeah. so are they renaming themselves but still staying under the umbrella of because yeah, yeah, you need the umbrella you, don't you? you you do need the umbrella because the umbrella brings you compliance and brings you all the things that you need to do to operate as well. efficiencies mm. technology efficiencies yeah. and what have you but you're right but even today i think a lot of the amp um, advisors still just use their um, umbrella brand or mm. their sorry their um their their, their own brand mm. so that might be peter switzer financial planning proprietary mm. limited which mm. Sorry, I'm not putting you under yeah. AMP, I'm, Peter. I've been, I've been totally independent from <laughs> the day totally I was born. But in terms of using yeah. their own name yeah. or their own brand, yeah. um, that's often been the case for the last few years anyway. Mm. But you're seeing it more now. They're sort of not putting the AMP brand front and centre on their websites. Okay. What's happening to the smaller financial planning companies and then the middle size? Yeah. Who are benefiting from the fact that the Royal Commission has put the industry asunder? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, well, I'd say there's an interesting dynamic happening at the moment. So the bigger, bigger licensees or the bigger groups um, are picking up a lot of these advisors at the mm. moment. And there's a, there's a mid-tier group, I would say, the, fee, the 10 to 100 advisor band, mm. um, which um, probably going to incur a little bit of um, oversight from ASIC over the next yeah. wee while. Mm. Um, you know, with the compliance regulations, obviously the Banking Royal Commission has got uh, a lot of recommendations around quarterly compliance reporting, information sharing to the market. Uh, those sorts of things are going to put a lot of cost uh, back into those uh, licensees. Mm. Um, and that's going to have to be borne by the advisors. And are the, have the licensees got the capital to do that? So you're finding the bigger guys uh, 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 who, are, who are quite well structured, um, are picking up a lot of the licensees. Those in the 10 to 100 band are trying to pick up advisors, but they really need to have strict processes, efficiencies in place. And then you're seeing the sub 10 licensee band who probably don't need the amount of process mm. that these other big groups have. Mm. They're, um, I guess they're peddling along. And I'll put, you know, you know, Peter, you're in that bucket in mm. terms of probably not needing the same sort of infrastructure cost base um, for, for those advisors, I think that's going to grow. Mm. But what that means is ASIC have a much more of a burden trying to manage that that long tail of advisors mm. in the mm. sub-10 bracket. Yeah, and um, so, and I, and I presume, you know, as you pointed out earlier, advisors over 50 are just saying, too hard, too I'm hard, getting out. Too hard, we're seeing that now. Um, the average age of advisors has gone down from, I think 56, 57 mm. down to 52. Mm. Um, and that's just by, n by nature of the, the advisors leaving the industry. So, and they're moving mm. into, you know, a lot of them are moving into coaching positions or retaining their directorships and trying to bring new advisors mm. into the fold. What about the cost to the consumer, the end user? Yeah. Is the Royal Commission in, in making financial planners more honest? I guess that's the bottom line, isn't mm. it? Like, is there something wrong with financial planning, it was the level of honesty. Uh, I don't think it was as much, well, some, some people probably failed in terms of getting the best possible product, but that could have been a dishonest thing as well. Um, what's it going to mean? What is the average uh, financial planning going to cost? Well, at the moment, well, we're, we're, we're envisaging the average cost for a financial advice today ongoing is about $2,300. We think with the removal of grandfather commissions, with the cost of compliance, um, and what we've seen anecdotally and uh, from from, our, <coughs> from the UK experience with the exit of a lot of the financial advisors, that's going to go up. Mm. And we, we, we think it's going to go north of $4,000 per year. Mm. What would normally cost $2,300 for advisors yeah. to actually 
retain their margins to operate a yeah. sustainable business. Yeah. But to charge 2,300, that masked the fact that many of them were getting Correct. commissions. Uh, commissions and, yeah, yeah. And, and because a lot of people do believe that financial plans have roughly charged 1% of funds under management. Yep. Is that still the case? Uh, that is, that has been the case, but we think that that will go up. It, it has More been- More than 1%? Yeah, more than one percent. So, if someone comes with a million yep. dollars, they're going to be expected to pay about ten grand for advice. Yeah, yes. for like the, so the plan yep. would probably be cheaper, but the ongoing advice. Yeah, we've, we've seen, we've seen, um, we've seen, uh, we've seen premiums go up. We've seen obviously that cost going up over the last twelve months. Yeah. People are resetting their their their, their cost bases, yeah. and those that aren't, those that don't have the client base to afford it, they're exiting. Yeah, yeah. so it means a lot of uh, average Australians would not believe that. It would cost ten percent. It could cost one percent or oh, ten thousand no, dollars. Well, that's always been the case. But also, yeah. given the level of regulations, the number of hours that go in, and the cost of employing a financial planner, it's kind of understandable, isn't it? Yeah. Well, what you're going to see is obviously there's a lot of um, technology coming through in this space. Mm. A lot of technology coming through yeah. in this space, and it's really incumbent on financial advisors today is how do I implement that technology? Mm. Because how do you get the technology to then be replace you, I guess, so to speak, for the um, the lower threshold clients, and then bring them through once they become a little bit more complex, yeah. um, so you can actually add value. Mm. Um, and that's what we're seeing now with a lot of financial advisors who are seeing, I guess, the writing on the wall mm. um, is how do you step back, and <laughs> how do you step back mm. when you've got to go through an exam and do a new degree and what have you, but they've yeah. got to step back from their businesses and go, mm. how do we actually give advice to Australians? Yeah. This can be very challenging. Yes. Thanks for joining us, Angus. Thanks, for, thanks very much. Okay, okay that's Angus Woods from Advisor Ratings. In the age of unusual lenders and an unusual financial system, along comes Nimble, and it's changing the way it does business. I'm talking to the CEO of Nimble, Gavin Slater. Gavin, thanks for coming to the program. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so tell us about the history of Nimble. Yeah, well, Nimble, uh, Peter, is probably one of the first fintech and real disruptors. It started in the mid-2000s and essentially it built itself into a very successful online non-bank lender, but mm. providing small cash loans to customers in need. Mm. Uh, so that's the history of Nimble. Uh, but what we are announcing and we've been talking about is our ambition to turn Nimble into a new business. Mm. It's still the same name, name, still the same brand, but take it more uh, into bigger products and, and bigger customer segments and mm. ultimately turn it into a digital bank. Now, in your press release, you actually say um, getting out of payday lending. So Nimble was associated with payday lending. D did it have the negativity that's often associated with payday lending? It certainly has some negativity associated mm. with payday lending. I think, you know, people have a I think just a general view around payday lender has yeah. seen it's full with predatory lenders. Yeah. But certainly as I've got into the business and as I lead the business, I'm really proud of what Nimble does. We're mm. certainly not a predatory lender, we're a responsible lender. Mm. Um, but we have ambitions to take Nimble and, and grow it as a company and get yeah. into bigger products and bigger customers. Okay, segments. so before going on about where yeah. heading, uh, people need to understand, what's the difference between a payday lender and a predatory payday lender? I think it's fundamentally comes back to the customer. Mm. You know, a customer has a need, and mm. to me, Nimble uh, does responsible lending. So mm. we assess a customer's affordability to pay. First and foremost, a customer has a need to borrow credit, and, and in our case, those customers simply do not have the discretionary cash if their car breaks down, if they have to put down a rental bond, uh, emergency uh, medical expenses. So there's a need to uh, they, they, they ask for credit mm. and then we assess them. We only approve 15% of applicants. Mm. Uh, we don't lend to people that are unemployed. We look for gambling patterns and we don't lend to people that are unemployed that have gambling habits. Mm. So uh, for me, that's responsible lending. Mm. Uh, and we do it at, uh, at rates that reflect our cost of capital and yeah. the tenor of the loan. Predatory yeah. lending, on the other yeah. hand, is just uh, charging exorbitant rates. And, and for desperate people. For desperate people and giving them credit when they shouldn't be given credit. Yeah. Um, so. Give it, give it a typical example of uh, the kind of borrower that would be a classic case for Nimble. So our customers have, uh, generally earn around about $50,000 a year. Uh, many of them hold down two jobs to make up that $50,000 a year. Mm. So um, holding down two jobs, um, typically uh, they would be borrowing money, as I say, for rental bonds so they don't own their own home. 
Uh, so they need the rental bond to get into property while they're switching. Uh, their car breaks down. Um, many of our uh, customers are employed by some of the major corporates, mm. retailers, and even some government departments. Mm. Um, so uh, we best describe our customer base. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's the old world. Yeah. What's the new world for Nimble? So the new world for Nimble is, is really uh, starting to focus on and broadening, I guess, our focus on customers that certainly earn more mm. and therefore have a capacity to, to borrow larger amounts. So for us, it'll be personal loans up to $25,000 initially, uh, both unsecured and then secured car loans. Uh, we have aspirations to get into the mortgage market over time and then broaden our proposition out uh, to be a full service digital bank, mainly targeted at millennials, mm. where we see a real opportunity exists for someone like Nimble. Okay, so in, given that, and, and the world is changing, when we look at the ads on TV, we've even got Alec Baldwin doing ads yeah. for, you know, for, for personal loans, yeah. um, wearing, wearing a t-shirt no less. Um, but the, the, I guess the point is, if there's all these loans out there which are, yeah. are pretty high in, in terms of the interest rate that they charge, why can't there be institutions like you that also offer very good term deposit rates? Because ultimately, you yeah. need money, and, if, and I think a lot of people would be happy with 4% term deposit rates, and you can lend them out 10, 12, 13% and make a pretty good profit. Why isn't that kind of situation available now? Yeah. I think it's a great question, Peter, and that certainly lines up with where we want to take Nimble. Yeah. I mean, we do need a, a banking license to be able to hold deposits, but certainly our ambition is to be able to offer deposits with higher interest rates than what you can get with the major banks today. Mm. Uh, and then similarly, you know, we lend that money and we'll be charging based on the risk profile of the customer and mm. the, the length of the loan and the size of the loan, you know, charging them, you know, a, a, a rate of interest that reflects the obligation that we're taking on, but at the same time, paying our depositors a higher rate. Mm. Uh, I mean, the government guarantees, you know, uh, deposit taking institutions up to $250,000. Yeah. So uh, there's certainly every opportunity for someone like Nimble to offer a customer mm. a deposit account paying a high interest rate. How difficult is it going to be for you to get a banking license? Uh, I think, well, that will always come down to APRA. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, they're the ones that decide whether we get a banking license. Um, we are in the very early stages of having conversations with APRA. Um, I think from my perspective, and certainly the conversations I've had with APRA, um, they certainly look for organisations that have senior bankers with experience in, in financial services, mm. uh, both on the board and in the management team, and we certainly have that. We are a going concern. We have a credit license. We have a proven track record of lending money responsibly. So, you know, I would say our chances are pretty good. That mm. said, though, um, there's a lot more we'll have to work through in terms of overall uh, risk management and governance, uh, mm. the capital we'll need as well, liquidity management policies and those type of things that will need to be in place. Mm. Do you see Nimble being a listed company one of these days? It's one of our ambitions, mm. ultimately, is to uh, take Nimble to a listing. But, gee, there's a lot of work. Mm. Uh, to happen before we get to that point. Okay. One, one last thing, mate. Um, there's a, a community um, idea that um, institutions like yours that lend at yeah. high interest rates are uh, doing it to people who, who shouldn't get money. What, what's the best argument against that? Yeah. Well, I can categorically, from Nimble's perspective, say we don't do that. Mm. And, and why do I say that and why am I so confident? Well, fundamentally, it comes back to who we lend to. We don't lend to people that are unemployed. We don't lend to people. We look for gambling habits. Mm. Uh, as part of our credit decisioning, which is leading edge in many respects, we scrape 90 days of a customer's bank statement information and we work out their daily surplus cash before mm. we make a lending decision. The fact that we only approve 15% of loans and they are for legitimate needs, mm. uh, you know, the really reasons why I'm so confident we don't do what people call predatory lending. That said, though, um, there are absolutely participants in the industry, which is a great tragedy, that do take advantage of vulnerable people. Mm. Uh, and, and in my view, there's no place for that. Mm. But where else do they go if they, they can't get credit when they need it from anybody else? Mm. Why don't regulators stop that? Well, I think I'd love to see regulators stop that. Mm. And I think, you know, for me, a more meaningful conversation will be not only how much regulation can be put in place to protect vulnerable consumers, but I absolutely think there's a role for government and the major banks and the super industry superannuation funds 
to provide funding facilities to responsible lenders like Nimble mm. to help us lower our cost of capital and we'd be able to better serve a wider sector of the community than what we're able to at the moment. Kevin, thanks for joining us on the program. Thanks, Peter. Kevin Slater, CEO of Nimble. We'll be back in a moment. Brad, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks, Pat. All right. So I think before we kick off, you've got a really boring title, Quantity <laughs> Surveyor. But I've always said to people, these guys can bring exciting results to people who own um, a property as a landlord or as a property investor. So explain to my audience what a Quantity Surveyor does. Yeah, it's an interesting title, uh, Peter. And uh, what we do is even sometimes more boring, I suppose, is we we actually estimate the cost of houses. So we can get a, a set of plans and we can count the bricks yeah. and tell you how much it should cost to build. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and where that flows across to tax while we're on interesting subjects mm. uh, is this depreciation that you claim is allowed to be claimed against properties that are used as investment properties. Mm. And we estimate costs mm. and that comes up with uh, how much claim is able to be made based on the construction cost of those buildings. Yeah, so legally you help people reduce their tax, legally, and you also know stuff that even accountants miss. Yeah, look, people think we, uh, we, we does, doesn't my accountant look after that mm. uh, regularly, but uh, our expertise is actually in construction costs mm. uh, and then marrying that up with the tax laws. And we, we work alongside the accountants mm. with a, a report that tells them some of the numbers in your tax return, but I mean, the accountant's got lots of numbers. Mm. Uh, we go out and actually visit the property and they have an expertise that helps to you know, legally get as much as we can out of that uh, deduction that's there. And your services are tax deductible to a property investor as well? Absolutely, yes. Oh, isn't that great that that actually <laughs> happens and helps you? All right, so how can investors and homeowners make the most of their depreciation at tax time? Look, I, I, the, the important thing really is to make sure you claim everything you claim. We, mm. we over time always talk to these people, they've bought properties. Sometimes I guess under, um, investors don't always really understand how to work those numbers. Mm. Uh, and going in and making sure that you do everything you legally can. It's just, it's a bit like, you know, trying to do your own tax return when you don't know all the rules mm. is like, not, do, not doing it properly, quantity surveyors that know how to get the most out of it, mm. just means more cash in your back pocket. So mm. making sure you just get everything and that means visiting it and, yeah. and uh, collecting all the right so information. So the, the normal homeowner doesn't get any depreciation benefit? Yeah, look, uh, the one that is excluded mm. is uh, your principal place of residence. There's yeah. no yeah. tax deductions against yeah. those, but anything else, you know, mm. commercial properties as well mm. do get depreciation, but oh. not your house. That you're living in. Um, before I go into my other questions, another question's bobbed up in my head. That's what I do, you know. I think and listen and ask questions it's at good. the same time. It's, it's quite rare in the media. Uh, um, once upon a time, people would say, you're both buying a new apartment because your depreciation is going to be bigger on the building, as opposed to a really old building where there's no depreciation because it's so old. But then other people say, but you can get more capital gain on an older building. And, and you would have seen both cases. Well, what's your answer when people say, what's the best, new you, or old? Well, look, uh, um, from a depreciation point of view, I think um, it, it actually comes down to the fundamentals that are going to uh, drive value and growth out of that property as to, as to the reasons to buy, not mm. this one's got the most depreciation. However, Depreciation is one of the things that helps the cash flow so you can actually mm. hold onto that property over time. Yeah. And uh, I'm the depreciation guy, so... Uh, you like yeah. depreciation. <laughs> well, yeah. Let's hit the question. Uh, I, I buy a, 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 a brand new apartment. Yeah, it's a, a million dollar apartment, for example. How much will I be able to claim depreciation per year and for how long? So brand new apartment, around a million dollars is mm. probably about you know, twelve to $15,000 a year over the first few years, mm -hmm. and you've actually got a full 40 years of claims. So if you've still got that property in 40 years time, yeah. uh, you get to claim that for, for 40 years. Okay, and I think that's a, a really powerful incentive. What if you bought it, say, when the thing is 15 years old, do you get the other 25? Yeah, it kind of works like that. You mm -hmm. don't get as much as you do at the start because of some of the things that you can't claim, but 
And also we're looking at something you've bought 15 years ago that mm -hmm. probably cost less to build 15 years ago than it mm -hmm. does today. Yeah. So, so the starting price is important for the actual claim as well? Well, the starting construction cost, and usually construction costs go up over time. Mm -hmm. So if you buy something that's 15 years old, yes, you've still got 25 years, um, years left to go of claims. Mm -hmm but you've kind of missed out some of the things that are at the start. So there's still deductions on old properties, okay. uh, just not as much. What have been the recent policy changes that people should be aware of? And maybe, because I remember the time that I used to say to people, if you're becoming a property investor and you don't go and get a quantity surveyor from the outset, well, you're an idiot. I was subtle like that. I guess you still want me to say that, don't you? <laughs> but but the, the appeal has been reduced a tiny bit because of a budgetary decision. Yes, in uh, May 2017. They, you remember it well. Ah, uh, the 7th, uh, 9th of May <laughs> at 7.30pm. Yeah. And was it Scott Morrison? Uh, it was probably Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison. My student. He uh, uh, made your life a little bit harder. Yeah. Explain. I, I, was, uh, I was actually at budget night and got very surprised yeah. <laughs> as they announced uh, some changes. Us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and... Uh, what it means now is that secondhand, there's, there's a couple of parts of depreciation. Mm. Secondhand plant and equipment, which is one part, which is things like your carpet, your hot water services, your stoves, your blinds, your curtains. Mm. Those things no longer get a claim if they're secondhand. Mm. You still get to claim on a piece of the building, mm. but you don't get to claim on those uh, items as soon as they become secondhand as a yeah. secondhand buyer. Yeah. What, what if the place is, a, is, say, a two or three year old place, but all the fittings are new? and you buy it, are they second-hand then or if they come as new and never been used? Is that part of the law or not? So the law, the, the law says previously used plant and equipment. Uh, if you used. buy, yes, if you buy a new unit from a developer, mm. uh, they're actually, if they couldn't sell it, they've got six months to sell it to you and still call it new as okay. trading stock. Mm. If you buy it and replace all the stuff to new, mm. then you get to claim the stuff as new. Okay. Uh, but if it's not, if it's been used at all for anything, someone yeah. lived in it, then it gets automatically. So effectively, out. if you get a refurbished apartment that has all new fittings and stuff like that, as an investor, you could claim that as long as no one's used it. Um, so it's, it's interesting. It, kind of, yes, uh, it? providing it's a, what's known as a substantial renovation. So mm. they've put a few rules around that. Yeah, okay. Uh, always good, I guess, to check before you go ahead that mm. has there been enough work done to this to see it as and who new would, stuff. And who would you actually ask to do that checking? <laughs> the quantity surveyor probably <laughs> yes, has I a bit of an idea of the rules. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Um, okay, anything else we should know? Uh, on those changes, look, this old old properties still get some deductions, mm. it's just not as many. Mm. Uh, so when you're crunching those numbers on the buy, mm. uh, just remember they're going to be a bit less. There's okay. plenty of tools to work out okay. what they are. I shouldn't be telling you a job, but if you're flogging your business better than you are currently, you'd also say, I presume, okay, I could be wrong, if you become a property investor and then you change, for example, the stove, the fridge and all that sort of stuff, you do get to claim them as new, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. If you anything that you spend and add to your property, uh, you get to make some claims for. Yeah. Uh, and always good to, to to look at before you renovate as well, mm. because mm. there's some deductions available sometimes to the things that you're throwing away. Mm. So always good to make sure you get the appropriate mm. advice before cool. you start ripping it apart. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really making it more important than I thought you were before <laughs> you walked in. All right. So why is it important for people to be aware of the appreciation as investors? Do you think just generally? I think when we buy investment properties, we're buying them to make some money yeah. uh, and uh, you know, choosing the right property and all those sorts of things are very important. But I mean, depreciation just means more cash flow. Yeah. So if you want to give it to the tax office, that's fine, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't usually like to give unnecessary money to the tax office. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's, a, it's a deduction that's non-cash that people often don't understand or do properly. Mm. So get it done properly because you're there to make some money from it. You might as well get it all. Yeah, good answer. Uh, as examples, last financial year, it says our clients, so it must be after your press release, but it's an interesting question. Claimed an average of $716 for carpet, $924 for package air conditioning units, and $468 for blinds. Please talk to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're just the average across, you know, we, we've, you know, we've got a couple hundred people. We do 
50, 60,000 of these things a year. Yeah. And, uh, and an idea of the average claim is what that, that article talks about. And just some of the unusual items that will go and they're not, those items aren't quite so unusual, unusual but... Yeah. Give but, me, the, give me the, the most unusual one that you, you can recall. Oh, part of the same press release was, you know, tennis umpire chairs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Fairly I unusual. guess in, in an apartment uh, complex, uh, it's, a, it's an asset, isn't uh, it? Absolutely. There's not a whole heap of tennis courts, no. uh, but uh, that, some things like that. The old garden names always comes up pretty okay. regularly. Door closers and things. There's, there's lots of things that, are, that you can class to claim mm. quicker that we find. I guess the bottom line, is if it's a part of the attraction of the property and of which you're getting income, then that asset ha is depreciable. Yeah, you, you're, you're buying and, and these things are being used for the purpose of producing income. Mm. Um, Who determines the life, Brad? The tax office actually determines the life. Even on a garden gnome. On a garden gnome. No? <laughs> on, on, uh, on everything they actually put out a yeah. list. There's about 170 of them, 167 I think it is, in, in a residential property. Yeah. And then the, the, the actual building itself gets its life as well. Okay. Now, we, we talked about how they changed the, the rules about um, claiming for older stuff that's an you know, investment property you've bought. But what about if you've been a dumb claimer in the past because they didn't go to a quantity surveyor or they didn't read the rules as well as they should? Can you retrospectively get even for claims you should have made? Yeah, Pat, it's a bit like uh, when you, uh, if you don't pay the tax, the tax office finds you. Mm. Uh, kind of works the other way, just not for as long. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go back and amend pretty easily up to two years of your tax return. So. Mm. I mean, the important thing, given the time of year we're at at the moment, you're thinking about another tax return. So if you haven't uh, been doing it properly, then you can go back and amend your last two and you might have some claims for this year. So mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to find out whether or not that's worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's calculators we've got or we can give an indication yeah. of how much money there might be there. And you just check that against your current tax return mm -hmm. and see if you leave any money at the tax office. <laughs> Do you reckon there are many, and I'd, I'd like a precise percentage on this one, of people who are you know, property investors, but they've basically done it themselves and they really haven't been claiming much at all. Uh, we, we did some research on this and mm -hmm. it's, it's very close to 80% of people are leaving some money on the table. Yeah. So uh, that, that includes investors. the people who aren't picking up stuff at all, but do you think there are even a small number of people, probably people who are getting rent cash in hand, that sort of person may well be... Um, <laughs> thinking they're gaining on one hand but losing on the other hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Look, there's, there's people that aren't claiming as much as they could be claiming because yeah. they haven't done it properly. But then there's also, I guess, those. Mm. Um, sometimes, I mean, really, always should crunch all the numbers on properties mm. and sometimes take a little bit of cash, which is not right anyway. No, uh, the law. We, we, we don't <laughs> recommend that sort of thing. Actually, may be a false economy anyway yeah. uh, because you're probably... Because it's cash, you're doing it cheaper, you're missing out on the deductions you may be able to claim. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd like to do the right thing anyway. Uh, but um, sometimes it may even be better to do the right thing. Yeah. Well, that's Brad Beard from BMT Tax Depreciation. And that's our special look at some businesses really growing and doing some really good stuff. If you want to know more, go to growyourbusiness.com.au.